Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Todd Stoll, Vice President of Education of Jazz at Lincoln Center, whose mission it is to entertain, enrich, and expand a global community for jazz through performance, education, and advocacy. Todd has generously agreed to share some of his experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Todd, for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be here. Jazz is such a uniquely American art form. There is nothing like it on the planet, and it, and it was founded here. Talk about jazz as an art form and jazz education as being so important to the continuation and the refreshing of that mm -hmm. art form. So in its most basic definition, we believe jazz has three components, blues, swing, and improvisation. Um, those three components have direct correlation um, as metaphor to the American experience, which is swing is individuals working together for the betterment of all. Improvisation, which is the individual voice. Every individual has something to say. And then the blues, which is that eternal optimism in the face of adversity, which America has always had. Um, you know, in its most perfect practice form, uh, jazz really is a metaphor for democracy. If you see a band on the bandstand, there's democratic principles going on for it to sound good, for it to actually get to the point where musicians will say, oh man, that's really swinging. Um, they have to work together, they have to play in balance. Um, they don't actually have to like each other and get along. I mean, you could, you could say that you know, the acoustic bass, which is the softest and lowest instrument, is the natural enemy of the drums, which are the loudest, and with a cymbal, that's the highest, most you know, piercing sound. So, but they, for the, something to swing, it has to, they have to get along. Many times we think Congress could take a, a good jazz <laughs> lesson <laughs> to, figure out, to figure this out, because it's the reconciliation of opposites. Well, how do you create a dialogue? How do you create a dialogue amongst those opposites, among the, amongst these different people, often who come together, mm -hmm. not necessarily, um, with, 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 a, with a long past history. They have to mm -hmm. come together and create the relationship and they have to create the relationship in the performance and the, and the relationship actually evolves in the process mm -hmm. of performing because of the, the nature of jazz as including both structure and unstructured elements. Mm -hmm. There is this, this improvisational quality in which you might start with an idea, but that idea can transform and you can end up with a totally different type of uh, idea as the performance mm -hmm. unfolds. And well, that, that's part of the, the uniqueness of jazz is that, so our, our Jazz Link Center Orchestra and Wintner are on tour in South America right now. We're doing uh, you know, four weeks down there, 12 countries or 12 cities, um, where we're doing some residencies. The language itself, there are basic parameters of the language. If you can speak the basic language, you can be at a jazz club in Lima, Peru, you know, speaking the same language as you would be speaking in Tokyo or Rome or New York City or London. Um, and that basic language and those parameters give us the ability to communicate with each other. And then it's up to each individual to bring their own expression, their own experiences. It's funny, uh, Dizzy Gillespie, who I got to meet only a couple times, said that playing bebop, which is commonly referred to as like our common practice period, mm -hmm. um, and generally what is taught in a lot of universities, uh, that playing bebop is like changing the fan belt on a car while the engine is running. <laughs> Which you have to imagine that, because so you're, you're making decisions at the speed of light. Winton actually did a lecture at Harvard last year about this exact topic, about how musicians communicate. It's basically autonomous teams. Right. Um, we do a series of uh, business and corporate workshops about building autonomous teams. That every, you know, how do you, it's not top-down management anymore. Autonomous on the one hand, but teaming on the other, right? right? So right. you have this, this respect for the contribution of the individual and the sensibility yep. of the in individual. And then you also have not only respect, but you also have collaboration. Right, at a, ver at a very, very high level. Now, that's in small group jazz. When you're talking about an organization like the Count Basie Orchestra or the Woody Herman Band or you know, the Duke Ellington Orchestra. Although, when you talk to guys that were in Duke's band, he wasn't necessarily the most strict leader, but he wrote most of the compositions. Now, he wrote those specifically for individuals in his band right. to get the most out of their sound. When you go to the Smithsonian and you look at his compositions, he never wrote first trumpet, second trumpet, third trumpet. He wrote cat, you know, he wrote their names on it, which is really interesting. So it, it kind of defies the kind of 
systematic categorization that Western classical music has. Well, years ago, his, his New York sessions were republished, and I, mm -hmm. I purchased all of the CDs at that time. I mean, nowadays we don't purchase CDs anymore, but, and it was interesting to, to listen to the various uh, performances and the various years. But when you look back at how the composition of his uh, orchestra uh, evolved, and, and you start to see how themes have been transformed, and, and you start to think, well, you know, it, it's definitely attached to a person, a sensibility, mm -hmm. a capability. This is a composer in dialogue with his performers who themselves become part of the composition and are contributing to the composition themselves. And, and I think that's so interesting, the whole idea of shaping organizations' performance, whether it's in a jazz environment mm -hmm. or whether it's in a nonprofit organization, according to the gifts of your partners. You know, with, with and we use Duke as metaphor in, at Jazz Lincoln Center all the time, because that was our first orchestra was founded with the surviving members of the Duke Ellington Orchestra. Um, and our major signature arts program, education program, is called Essentially Ellington. So using that type of metaphor for doing business is, is really uh, central to a lot of uh, what we do at Jazz Lincoln Center. Um, you know, it's funny when you were talking about Duke, I think about all those great ballads he wrote for Johnny Hodges, his lead alto player, and it was because of Johnny's particular talents that Duke wrote those things. Um, it's really interesting, and you know, when you talk about leadership in a, in a large arts, corporate arts environment, uh, one of the things that Winton has done as our managing director is really put trust and faith in the leaders of the particular uh, lines of business that we have. He's, he's been very good about allowing people to speak their minds. You know, you have to have a forum where people feel valued and safe uh, so you could have disagreements with each other. And that's something that we, we actively breed at Jazz Lincoln Center is the ability to speak to each other um, very openly and honestly. To have your own voice. To have your own voice. But we also have to concertize and swing together to really make it work. So how does that work in terms of your mission and how you, you develop in your mission a consistency, an alignment that allows enough uh, place for individual voice, mm -hmm. for disagreement, but also at the end of the day is, is driving and, and ensuring that energy has the maximum return mm -hmm. in terms of, of creating the, the results, the education, mm -hmm. the music that you wish to create. A couple different ways. Winton wrote a document um, four years ago called The Road Ahead, and it has it outlines the 12 principles of jazz business. So we have these 12 principles that really kind of guide what we do, um, and ultimately we have three pillars of our mission, performance, education, and advocacy. Um, we just rewrote this mission statement three, three years ago when Greg Scholl, our executive director, came on board. So we're still in the process of concertizing the business around those three pillars. Um, and part of that is, you know, as senior management, senior leadership is getting together and really making sure when we make our plan, so we, our programming plan is two, three years in advance. I write an education plan that is in line, alignment with that. You have quite a range of programs, Jazz Lincoln Center. Could you just describe that range for us? So essentially we have three things that we do. We have our Jazz for Young People program, which is outreach, concerts, and curriculum for teachers. We have our Century Ellington program, which is uh, a national competition and a publishing program and a series of regional festivals. We have 15 regional festivals. And then the third thing we do is teach classes. And those classes range from uh, our WeBot program, which is very popular. It's for eight months to five years old, um, where we teach about jazz instruments, jazz styles, jazz friends, and jazz concepts. Um, in classes with uh, a caregiver, so it's not a drop-off program. You know, you come with your child and you take uh, eight classes over an eight-week period once a week and you learn all kinds of great interactive activities and we have, and, it, and it, what's great about it, it's always with live musicians. So you have a teacher who sings and a live piano player and it's, it's a phenomenal class. We're actually getting ready to expand to four sites nationally next year um, and we'll continue to expand and looking for licensees around the country. Um, and then that rolls on into our, our middle school jazz academy and our youth programs. We basically teach jazz on Saturdays and Sundays to uh, young people from 7th through 12th grade. We now have 13 bands and about 160 kids in that program. Uh, and the, we have three middle school sites, Manhattan, the Bronx, and Brooklyn, and then a high school 
youth program. Um, we also have Swing University, which is jazz appreciation. It's evening classes, primarily for adults, but it's open to anyone of any age. Um, led by arguably the world's greatest jazz historian, Phil Schapp, who's on WKCR and teaches at Juilliard. Um, and he's the dean of this program, and it's everything from a class on Bix Beiderbecke um, to a class on Sidney Bechet, mm. um, all about appreciating jazz through listening. He also has a, our core curriculum is Jazz 101, 201, and 301. Um, I dare say that our Jazz 301 is a graduate level jazz history course. If you can pass the final exam for that, <laughs> <laughs> I have not taken that class yet. <laughs> I'm a little nervous. Um, and then we do outreach into hospitals and senior centers. So uh, we work with uh, you know some of our bands that go into those places and do amazing work with senior citizens, um, children's hospitals, and rehab centers. Mm -hmm. So we have a very wide variety of programming uh, from eight months to 80 years old. Uh, last year, we did almost 3,000 individual education events, almost seven per day. How do you get to be the vice president of, of <laughs> education at, at, at uh, Jazz at Lincoln Center? Talk about your career mm -hmm. uh, trajectory and, and your evolution as an artist and now mm -hmm. as, as an orchestrator of, of education and, and the activities of other artists to create the next generations. Um, so, I, I mean, I, I'm a trumpet player. Uh, I went to the Conservatory of Music in Cincinnati, got a master's degree in trumpet. You know, I, I spent 20, almost 25 years in public education. I uh, ended up as a, a curriculum coordinator for a large suburban school district outside Columbus, Ohio. Uh, founded a community organization called the Columbus Youth Jazz Orchestra, uh, which eventually became part of uh, the oldest jazz organization in the country. is called the Jazz Arts Group of Columbus, a um, nonprofit that's had a, a resident orchestra for over 40 years, education programs. We eventually merged with them, worked very closely with them for about a decade. Uh, it really was a community organization, uh, the Columbus Youth Jazz Orchestra, where it was like an all-star band originally, and then it became two bands and three bands, uh, small groups. We did touring, we recorded CDs, we played festivals. It was really just providing an opportunity for kids that were really gifted to come together and, and you know, learn from each other. Because it dawned on me that you know, the best players in any one given area, this is back in like the early 90s, maybe didn't all know each other. Right. Um, unless you went to a camp together or unless you went to uh, all state ensemble. So I just literally just started this kind of out of the blue with some uh, support from the, the city parks and recreation department in Columbus. And it, it became like this community. And we noticed that these kids grew up together, they played together, and then as they got older, they still remained in touch with each other. Um, had a lot of, you know, I don't know if, how you measure success in that particular um, arena, but for me, it's the fact that so many of those young people went on to have successful lives outside of music. There's doctors, there's lawyers, there's a lot of teachers, a lot of band directors out of that group. Um, there are some very prominent players, a great young pianist named Aaron Deal, who's uh, won the APAP competition a number of years ago and was recording now. But my most important work, I think, was always being a advocacy for jazz as part of a music curriculum. So when I started working on curriculum work with everything from general music all the way up through high school, you know, I, I tried to find ways that we could interject jazz into those things. So Winton and I had talked about that for years. We've been friends for a long time. We've talked about that for a long time, is how do we get teachers to be comfortable with teaching jazz? Um, and I helped him out with uh, Jazz for Young People curriculum, which Jazz at Lincoln Center introduced in 2001. Um, and we're currently revamping that in a, a more uh, media-friendly way for uh, the 21st century. Um, and so I was always around. I, was, uh, I ran a professional big band for 15 years in Columbus, Ohio. I was a Broadway contractor. I did a lot of different things um, and became a student of Duke Ellington's music. So I had a big band playing every Wednesday night at a club and we played almost exclusively Duke Ellington and also Charles Mingus, which was kind of interesting. That is interesting. <laughs> that is. Well, and for me, you know, people always say it's like Ellington and Mingus. And but Mingus is so amazing. I mean, he, he, to me, he is the quintessential man on the edge. Right. right. You know, he's just. Well, his if you think about it compositionally, the heir apparent to Duke Ellington in terms of melody and harmony is probably Charles Mingus. Thad Jones is there as well. Um, 
a handful of others. But Mingus really, in terms of just melodic writing, I think is he comes right out of Ellington, and he loved Duke Ellington. I, you you know, know, I never, I never really thought of it, but you know, it's not, it's, it's not my field. But yeah, well, and so, so I had now, this, now I'm going to go uh, run back and start <laughs> listening to <laughs> listen to uh, yeah. a tune like Reincarnation of a Love Bird. There's a whole, okay. there's a whole melodic sense that that Charles had, as well as he kind of invented his own harmonic. Uh, vocabulary and harmonic but very, sound. But also very austere. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, so. and, he, and he loved the blues. He loved the church. And that was something that Duke always loved. So I had this band that was playing this music. That's interesting. Um, okay. And, I mean, I just became a scholar of that music. So, uh, you know, sometime in the early 2000s, I was hired as a consultant at Jazz at Lincoln Center to work on the Essential Ellington program and help select music, uh, which I did for a number of years. Uh, and then the job opened up, and Winton and I have been talking for years. And it, you know, when the job opened up, I was just at a position in my life after being in public education for a long time, and I had taught at all levels and all areas. And you had your um, own ideas by that time. Of oh yeah, what well, and, and I was doing my own advocacy work, you know, separate and apart from Winton and Jazz at Lincoln Center, um, and would be still doing it to this day, from promoting concerts to performing to teaching to you know, running a community group. It's funny, I told Winton, I said, I've always had six or seven jobs, and now I have one. <laughs> so you're getting a deal, you know. You're, you're going <laughs> to pay me for one job, and I'm going to come here and work this one job. But it really, it was a, I was in the right place at the right time. I had been doing this work for the better part of, you know, a quarter of a century. Um, and it really, you know, I think the success that we've had at Jazz at Lincoln Center is because of the institution and with Winton's leadership, the institution's commitment to education. Right. We wrap education around everything we do. So you have to imagine, when I was a kid, um, who was someone I wanted to go see? Doc Severinsen. Okay? okay. So Doc Severinsen's playing with the local jazz group. He does kind of a open rehearsal, a QA. and a um, But you don't have access to him. I was 16 right. years old, right. you know. Um, Chuck Mangione was real big right. uh, when I was a kid out of Flugelhorn. My parents yeah. bought me. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and I transcribed yeah. a bunch of his songs. So, um, But you didn't get access to, to Chuck. When the Jazz at Lincoln Center Orchestra goes on tour and we roll into a city, say we're in uh, Des Moines, Iowa, the band is out. The guys are out doing workshops. Oh, we're bringing wonderful. local school kids in. Winton is teaching. Every city we roll into, if time permits, we do education events. Right. Every, so on this tour in South America that we're on, th we're doing more than 40 education events in four weeks. That's phenomenal. And that's, that's our standard operating procedure because those relationships that we make with these young musicians and their teachers, that's the audience development of the future. Mm -hmm. And that feeling we get with them and the, the humanity that goes back and forth because everything we do, we do with an optimum of love. And it's, it's, it's hard for me to imagine that just in my lifetime we've gone from no access to this unbelievable access because that's the important thing. Now, arts organizations need to get their heads around that because that's their audience development for the future. Right. Right there. Outreach. Right. You've, and, and, and the other part of this is that we go into communities that no one else wants to go into. So the first week of October, after the, the tragedy of Michael Brown's death in Ferguson, Missouri, we were at his high school doing a concert. No media attention, no national press. You know, it was set up through uh, our friends at uh, Jazz St. Louis. The entire band in Winton are at, you know, the high school that Michael Brown graduated from, doing a, f all, all this is free, by the way, doing a free concert and workshop with those music students there. That's what we do. We'll go to places that other people don't want to go. And we believe that that information is, is just as important to those communities as it is to an upper middle class community in the suburbs. But a lot of those kids have access and have opportunity that you know, kids in underserved communities don't have. So I would say probably 70 to 80 percent of our outreach work is in you know, communities that are completely underserved and don't have access. Um, as, as musicians and as educators were sometimes attracted to the kid who plays really well. You know, Winton gave a speech at the Midwest Conference in 2012 that, you know, where he said, a lot of people think I'm the perfect product of a music education system. He said, I'm not. The perfect product of, of our music education system is 
um, a postman whistling a Duke Ellington tune as he goes and delivers the mail. Well, and that's, that's what we'd like to see in America. Jazz is music, jazz is history, jazz is democracy, jazz as healing, mm -hmm. jazz as an exploration of diversity, jazz, jazz, jazz. <laughs> you should be on my team. <laughs> Todd Stoll, thank you so much for sharing your work at Jazz thank Lincoln you. Center and the work of this great organization. And thank you so much for your insight. Thank you.